I don't do game comparisons often. I chalk it up to the experience of multiple iterations of Edition Wars in D&D, World of Darkness, and a few other games. While sometimes there's some justification, more often than not they revolve around subjective shit, and that's not my style. And that's not to say I've avoided doing it. I just need the right method and the right games. Well, the stars have aligned in a way that warrants it this time. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'll be your gaming monk for the evening. Do you know what everybody loves? The phoenix rising from the ashes, as it were. Just ask the 91 twins. Going from the worst in the league to winning the World Series. Only for Minnesota Curses to strike again. Now why am I bringing up sports in an RPG review? Because it's a fitting parallel as we delve into the grim world of perilous adventure. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay has had an interesting history the last few years. Second edition is considered the peak of excellence by the fanbase, and Fantasy Flight's attempt to add a third edition with such a butt fumble that mere mention of it makes gamers start whistling the tune from Apocalypse Now. While I don't share that level of vitriol, I can sympathize to an extent. It was such a radical departure that it may as well have been a different game. In fact, it's probably why it's no surprise that the Star Wars FFG trilogy I reviewed in the past and its universal cousin Genesis have been far better received than Warhammer 3rd Edition was. Probably also doesn't help that they use a lot less board gamey stuff, but I'm getting off track here. What also didn't help was Games Workshop shitting the bed in nuclear fashion with the end times in the war game. Just another notch in the best worst company in the industry outside of the eternal lol cow that is Wizards of the Coast. But as they say, it's always darkest before the dawn. And this time the dawn took the form of two suns like we're looking over the Tatooine sunrise. These two contenders emerged to take the ball that FFG dropped. One official, and one a spiritual successor. First, Zweihander, 2017's crowdfund underdog. It's a retro clone of Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, and it's gotten quite the buzz by filling in the void that was left by the FFG experiment. While it does its best to be as legally distinct as possible, it's still Warhammer in all but name. But now, a challenger appears. Cubicle 7, a longtime indie darling of the UK. They've put out or translated plenty of games of high quality, ranging from the pretty good Lone Wolf reboot, the Doctor Who juggernaut, arguably the best Tolkien RPG with the One Ring, and translating the Wuxia epic known as Keen, which I reviewed a while back. When Asmodee decided to throw money at everyone, they forced Fantasy Flight to drop the license they had with Games Workshop, killing off the Warhammer 3rd and the much better received 40k RPG line. We'll get to those, I swear. Cubicle 7 picked up the Warhammer license, making their first move the re-release of first edition material on their digital store, chief among them being the Enemy Within series, leading us to a brand spanking new 4th edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So here we are, a return to percentile dice in the official sense, and a modern throwback. How do they hold out? Well, let's find out. Both use a similar style and format, albeit Warhammer's got a bit of an edge in production values for obvious reasons. They do a very good job of portraying the grim tone of the old world. That said, I think Zweihander has an edge in sheer content, running at nearly 700 pages compared to the 350 that Warhammer has. I do feel like its visual design tries too hard to be grim in the way that many OSR games do. Either way, there's plenty of little details that make both great to look at, and it's ultimately a toss-up on which does it best overall. Both games tread similar ground when it comes to character creation, with a few sidesteps for each. As such, we'll be going through character creation twice, the first for Zweihander and the second for Warhammer. In either case, we'll be making a mercenary type character, Sebastian Stark. First step in Zweihander is determining primary attributes, being combat, brawn, agility, perception, intelligence, willpower, and fellowship. Each of these start out at 25, and add a roll of 3d10 to the result. The resulting rolls that we got were 24, 18, 14, 22, 16, 22, and 19. Thus, the resulting primary attributes we have are Combat 49, Brawn 43, Agility 39, Perception 47, Intelligence 41, Willpower 47, and Fellowship 44. The 10's digit acts as the ability bonus for each, barring modifiers for races or careers. We'll get into that later. Step 2 is to choose a race and sex. We'll be skipping the random part of this since we already determined the character will be male, though the blurb about trans characters is baffling given the setting, and a human. Regardless, the choice of race provides the ability bonus and grants a racial trait. As a human, we gain plus one to combat, intelligence, and perception bonuses, and a minus one to agility, fellowship, and willpower bonuses. Regarding racial traits, we roll a d100 to determine the racial trait we'll get. Since we rolled a 71, we get Mountain Amongst Men. This allows us to wield any two-handed melee weapon with one hand. 
Step 3 is where we choose our archetype and profession, akin to Warhammer's careers. For the purposes of this character, we'll skip the archetype role and instead roll for the profession. In our case, we got a 79, giving us the sellsword career. Additionally, we gain the starting trappings of the warrior archetype that the sellsword falls into. A fire-hardened spear, heavy boots, a lantern, three laudanums, a military attire, an oil pot, some red cap mushrooms, some rucksack, a suit of leather armor, three tinctures, a wooden shield, and a mortuary sword. This allows us to set up our advanced scheme and gain the Dogs of War trait, meaning we do not suffer serious tier injuries. Step 4 is secondary attributes, the derived characteristics. First is the Peril Threshold, which determines how much mental stress they can handle. This is based on the character's willpower bonus and the modifiers as appropriate. The thresholds in this case are 6, 9, 15, and 21. The Damage Threshold works in a similar fashion, but uses Brawn instead of willpower and measures the wounds you can withstand before getting killed. In this case, our thresholds are 4, 10, 16, and 22. Encumbrance is, of course, how much you can carry. Based on Brawn, we have an encumbrance limit of 9. Initiative is fairly self-explanatory, and uses the Perception bonus. This makes our initiative 10. Finally, movement is your character's speed, in this case based on agility for a total of 7. Step 5 concerns your background, determining your birth time and your possible fate. Rolling D100 for each chart, we get the following. Season of birth rolled a 12, indicating a spring birth. Dooming, a superstition for each character, rolled a 55, thus making our dooming there is always another problem. For age, we rolled a 46, making us an adult, meaning we roll once on distinguishing marks. On distinguishing marks, we got a 71, giving us piercing eyes. For build type, we can't roll on this due to the racial trait we got. This makes us husky, and thus the price for trappings increases by 10%. This also makes our height 6 foot 1 and weighed at 247 pounds. Upbringing can determine what attribute we can improve at a faster rate. In this case, we had a militant upbringing, and thus we can purchase brawn advancements at half cost. Finally, social class, which determines our starting funds. Since we rolled 96, our social class is an aristocrat, starting with d10 plus 1 gold coins. In our case, 8. Step 6 determines fate points. Every character starts with 1 point, or 2 if they pick a drawback. Since we didn't do that, we only get 1 that we can use. Next, alignment. Instead of a 3x3 grid, we have a positive and negative extreme that we sit between depending on our actions. We rolled a 68 in this case, so our order alignment is independence and our chaos alignment is rebellion. Finally, in step 7 we build the finishing touches to our character. We get 1000 reward points to spend on advances. A hundred of these immediately have to go to the sellsword's professional trait, Dogs of War, as mentioned earlier. Each of the remaining advances costs 100 points, except for Brawn's characteristic bonus advances which cost 50. The advances we'll be spending are as follows. 2 Brawn, 1 Combat, 1 Athletics, 1 Martial Melee, 1 Simple Melee, 1 for Resolve, 1 Athletics, 1 Toughness, 2nd Skin, and Tough as Nails. On the whole, Zweihander's character generation is very OSR in its design. By that I mean it's very much in love with randomization. I don't mind that on paper, but full random works best with games that aren't using a heavy amount of customization or dedication. This is why it works so well in retro clones that emulate AD&D. I know there's a degree of randomization in Warhammer, but you can go too far the other way. That said, I absolutely adore the alignment system used here. It's a nice way to enforce the grayness of the setting without going full lawful stupid. The advancement system is fine, but I kind of wish the choices of advancements weren't as reliant on its formula on the number of skill ranks, ability bonuses, and talents. It's not bad, just a little too tight-knit for its own good. The first step is species. While it can be randomly determined, we're going with human once again in this case. Racial traits aren't present here, but it does determine the random role results for class and career. Step two, obviously, is class and career. Classes in this case are broad categories for the different types of careers, each of which has multiple tiers we'll get into later. In our case, we'll be going with the warrior class and the duelist career. Step 3 is attributes. 4th edition maintains the same characteristics as it has in the past of weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, initiative, agility, dexterity, intelligence, willpower, and fellowship. Wounds are the primary derived characteristic here, and faint, resilience, and extra points in movement are set by the race in question. Fate and resilience determine your sense of luck and your sense of grit, almost in an idealism versus realism kind of way. Regardless, our spread after the die rolls is weapon skill 40, ballistic skill 30, strength 39, toughness 38, initiative 37, agility 37, dexterity 36, intelligence 35, willpower 34, and fellowship 32. 
This makes our total wounds equal to 12, and our final spread for fate and resilience is 3 each, with our movement being 4, thus making our walk 8 and run 16. Lastly, for the purpose of resilience, we need to choose a single word that goes with the character's motivation. In our case, we'll go with survivalist, fitting the sword for higher character that we're going with. Step 4 is where we choose our skills and talents from the pools offered by both species and career. In regard to skills, you gain a set of advances you can pick from. Each advance increases that skill, or later ability, by 1. We'll handle the species skills first. For skills, you get to choose 3 to gain 5 advances each, 3 more to gain 3. Looking at the ones available, we'll go with Melee Basic 5, Evaluate 5, Cool 5, Lore Reikland 3, Language Bretonian 3, and, Le and Leadership 3. Talents have a choice of a set and or random talents on the appropriate table. Looking at the human talent list, we'll go with Savvy for the choice talent, and the three random talents rolled at 99, 51, and 30. This gives us the Warrior Born, Noble Blood, and Lightning Reflexes talents. Warrior Born and Lightning Reflexes grant permanent plus 5 increases to weapon skill and agility, making them 45 and 42. Career-wise, you may allocate 40 advances to its starting skills, with a cap at 10 and 1 talent. Since we're at the first tier in the Duelist career path, we'll go with 5 advances in each skill. Athletics, Dodge, Endurance, Heal, Intuition, Classical Language, Basic Melee, and Perception. The talent of choice is Beat Blade, which allows us to make melee tests to reduce advantage. We'll get into what advantage is later. Step 5 concerns trappings, your starting equipment, which is determined by your choice of class and career. Since we went with the Warrior class and the first tier of Duelist, Fencer, this grants us a bag, a set of clothing, seven bandages, a pouch, a basic weapon, a hand weapon, a sling, and a dagger. In addition, our status grants us a starting set of funds, based on a tier and level of status. Since Duelist is a Silver 3 career, we have 3d10 Silver Shillings, totaling at 26. This becomes 8 Shillings due to spending 18 of them on a leather breastplate. The final step is Advancement, wherein we spend the bonus XP we gained from creation, if any. For the purposes of demonstration, we'll assume we use the randomization steps, which means we have 120 XP to spend on characteristics, skills, and talents. The characteristics available to us are shown in the career entry. At our tier, we only have access to the ones marked with a cross, those being weapon skill, initiative, and agility. When we move up in tiers in this career, or shift into another career, we can gain advancements on the bronze, silver, and gold entries. This happens when advances are spent on each skill and characteristic equal to 5 times the career level, and at least one talent is bought. For this, we'll be spending 100 XP to give 4 advances to weapon skill, and 20 XP to dodge increasing weapon skill by 4 and dodge by 2. A recurring motif in character creation here is giving bonus XP if you do a random roll. I have mixed feelings about this, since it might incentivize random creation a bit too much. Also, I don't see the reason why there's no racial abilities in this case. I get not wanting to pit up a race solely for its perks, but those can go a long way to establish the advantages of playing said race and add to its identity. While Warhammer 4th Edition gives you a lot of control over the development, I can't deny that advancing from career to career can get very expensive. It starts out relatively small and gets exponentially higher if you go down the straight path for a career, to say nothing of the XP spent on changing careers. While it's a net positive and reinforces the grim nature of Warhammer, it might be a hard sell for those who prefer a more straightforward advancement. If nothing else, I can say that advancement won't have labyrinthine problems that previous iterations have had. Both games utilize a D100 system, wherein you attempt to roll under your primary characteristic to get a successful result, with every 10 points below being a degree of success. The difficulty of the task can be modified usually by degrees of 10. The method of automatic success and failure is a slight difference, since Warhammer treats a 1 to 5 result as success and a 96 to 100 as a failure, whereas Wyhander treats any roll of doubles as either one depending on the die result. Warhammer 4th Edition introduces an advantage system, which grants a cumulative plus 10 each time you succeed at an opposed test in combat, and resets when you miss in the same type of test. This is intended to mitigate the whiff factor in combat that comes from the fickle nature a D100 roll can have. Certain talents and abilities can modify how much advantage someone has. For example, the beat blade that our character does here. Zweihander introduces Chaos and Fury dice, both always being a D6. Fury is added to the final damage with attacks. When a Fury die is rolled, a result of 6 explodes, allowing you to roll another die and add it to the result. Chaos dice work similarly, but are used when risk of something terrible is invoked, and if a 6 is rolled on the Chaos die, 
then that given action has some form of unintended consequence. Now given that both of these are focused on grey moralities and subject decisions, they wouldn't be complete without a corruption mechanic. And this is where the alignments picked during character creation come into play for Zweihander. Whenever you would make a questionable action, you gain 1 to 9 points of corruption. At the end of the session, you'd roll a d10. If the result is less than your total corruption, you gain a chaos rank. And if the result is higher, you gain an order rank. Whenever you have 10 ranks of chaos, you gain a disorder. And in the case of order, you gain a fate point. In either case, both tracks reset after this. Fortune has always been Warhammer's extra effort mechanic. And these games are no exception. Though they split the mechanic into two. Sort of. Zweihander uses Fortune as a shared pool, not too far removed from the light and dark side points in FFG's Star Wars games. The starting Fortune pool is equal to the number of players in the party, and it can be used to re-roll a failed skill test, gain an additional action, or force a Chaos or Fury die to roll a 6. However, each time a point is spent, it converts to a misfortune point that the GM can use in the same way. Conversely, Warhammer splits it into four, technically being two thematic pairs. The first is Fate and Fortune, which represents the sense of luck a character has. Fortune can be used to reroll a failed test, add a success level, or interrupt the initiative to act. Fate acts as a way to cheat harm, either by letting you exit an encounter to save yourself from death, or completely ignore damage once. Resilience and Resolve represents your drive, grit, and determination. Resilience allows you to either deny mutation or corruption, or force a successful roll. Resolve lets you gain temporary immunity to psychology effects or critical wounds, or remove one condition you're suffering from. While Fate and Fortune is automatically restored at the start of each session, Resilience and Resolve is only restored when acting according to your motivation. Neither one has too much overlap, but I could see Warhammer's take to be argued as overdoing the resource management. On the other hand, I kind of wish Zweihander looped Fortune and Misfortune like FFG does with Light and Dark Side, instead of creating an expiration date for them. I'd be remiss if I didn't compare the mechanics for casting used by both games. In both cases, magic by wizards and sorcerers, and prayers used by the servants of the pantheons, allow for powerful effects but with their own costs of varying danger. Both are technically magic, but don't let any priest hear that lest you get introduced to the pointy end of something. We'll start with magic, the winds of Aether that wizards channel to affect the environment. To cast a spell in Warhammer, the wizard uses a language magic test. If your success is equal or higher to the casting number of the spell, the spell is cast. If you roll a critical, the winds flare dangerously high in your casting, granting additional power at a cost. You can either make an attack spell cause a critical wound, automatically cast it, or make it immune to spells. On the flip side, you must roll on the minor miscast table and resolve the effects. Furthermore, you can attempt to channel energy to cast a spell. This is done through using the channeling skill and extended test. When your success level reaches the casting number, you can cast it using language magic as normal, but treat the casting number as if it were zero. If you crit while channeling, you instantly cast the spell your next round, but roll a minor miscast. Additionally, if you roll a 10 over your skill, or roll doubles, you fumble and you have to suffer a major miscast. Prayers work similarly, but with a few tweaks. Casting either a blessing or a miracle is a prey test. If you succeed, it's cast and its effects are resolved. If you fumble, you've offended your deity and must roll on the Wrath of the Gods table. Additionally, if your actions violate your god's tenets, you gain sin. When making a prey test while having sin points, if the ones digit of the roll is equal or less to your sin points, you suffer a Wrath of the Gods roll, even if successful. Further, this roll is increased by 10 for each point of sin you have, though afterward you lose one sin. In the case of Zweihander, both magic and miracles work under the same mechanics. After selecting the spell and the GM adjusting the difficulty appropriately, the wizard makes an incantation test. Before rolling this, the wizard may opt to channel power, which decreases the difficulty by 10, 20, or 30, but you suffer 1 to 3 corruption and must roll a chaos die to determine if a chaos manifestation, or a divine punishment in the case of divine magic, is triggered. If the roll is successful, you cast the spell. When its duration is completed, you can move down the peril track to unfetter the spell, repeating the spell's duration. It's always been a nitpick of mine when magic from different narrative sources aren't different mechanically. While I like simplicity and use of risk in Zweihander, I'm not fond of the two types of magic being cast with the same general rules. Warhammer, conversely, does a bit of a better job of showing the differences between the two, since Zweihander's approach effectively has the same rules. The only real difference is the available effects and the consequences. Additionally, I think the use of corruption in channeling magic is a bit much in Zweihander's case. The chaos dice are enough to reflect the risk that channeling makes. 
I will admit part of this is rooted in my own biases, but I've never been a fan of the same stuff issue, and I'd be a hypocrite if I gave either game a pass for it. The million dollar question, one would think, is, which one's better? Ultimately, it's a toss-up because both have things that they do different or better. Both carry the grim and perilous nature that they need to have, but in different ways. Zweihander is straightforward, but a little restrictive. Conversely, Warhammer 4th offers a lot of control, but certain aspects might get complicated for some. Additionally, while Zweihander claims it can be used to craft stories set in works of Sapolsky, Martin, Cook, and so on, I think doing so is a misplaced priority. Zweihander is through and through Warhammer with the copyrighted material fouled off, and I doubt it'll be used for anything but that. Both of them are good games, but it ultimately depends on what you want. If you prefer a lot of control, go with 4th. If you prefer a straightforward experience, go with Zweihander. However, if you're a veteran of 2nd edition, I would say... wait. Both are still relatively new, with 4th edition coming out this year and Zweihander coming out last year, and there's going to be a bit of conversion work no matter which one you end up picking. Personally, I'd argue that 4th edition has a slight edge in this matter, but I'm waiting to see if either one puts out some sort of conversion guide. Either way, just play some damn games and have fun, even while the party is being torn limb from limb, as you do.